This is the Sideline Slice, presented by Valentino's Pizza, the official pizza of the Huskers. Here's your host, Jessica Cooty, and Huskers Radio Network Analyst, Jeremiah Searles. We're back with another episode of the Sideline Slice, as always, brought to you by our friends at Valentino's Pizza. Alongside Jeremiah Searles, I'm Jessica Cooty, and spring football is in the books. The annual spring game taking place on Saturday. Jeremiah was on the call for that one on BTN, made his television debut on the Big Ten Network. But we're going to dive into all of that, break down spring football, but I am by no means not I am not going to bury the lead on this episode because since we had our last episode the Searles family went from four to five as Graham Walter Searles is now a part of the family congratulations first of all how you sleeping good actually I hesitate even saying it but he's been my best sleeper he slept seven and a half hours last night and this is not normal for a Searles child. My <laughs> daughter did not sleep through the night for her entire first year of life. So we are holding our breath, crossing our fingers, doing the rain dance outside. Whatever we got to do, this baby is sleeping, and we're going to keep it that way. But it's been great having the new addition. You know, I think like Emma and I both feel like our family is whole. Um, you know, so this is it. This is done. No mas. <laughs> what do the other two think of? Little they baby just love Graham. him so much they try and kill him all the time. You know, they just want to play with him and just him. pick him up. And Oliver keeps asking when he's going to be able to wrestle him. And I'm like, we got, we got some time before the wrestling starts there, bud. So just hold off. Oliver even got to spend some time with you at spring football. Oh, he loved it. Yeah, we got to, I brought him out to a practice. Um, you His know, first Brett unofficial Wally. visit. Yes, his first unofficial <laughs> visit for left tackle, class of 2037. You know, so Matt Rule, if you're listening, uh, you got you got one in the wings here. So he loved it. Uh, Brent Qualley was there with his daughter Chandler. And, you know, it was just kind of a cool full circle moment for both of us just to be like, man, not that long ago we were out here banging in spring practice, and here we are with families in the next stage of life still out here at spring practice and being welcomed by the coaching staff and being welcoming the players coming up and slapping hands. And like It was just kind of a really cool moment for both Quali and I to just – Think of where we've come and how far we've come from being Huskers to still being Huskers and being still part of the program. And it's just always good to be back home in Memorial Stadium. And gravitating towards the O-line. You two of course. both were standing right of there course. with your kids. Chandler, she was a trip. She was awesome. Oh, yeah. Those two those two are going to burn some things down as they get older. There's no doubt about that. Oh, that's awesome. Well, uh, let's dive into it. How was the first TV broadcast for you? You know, it was really fun. You know, it was it was definitely different. Um, you know, I'm used to radio where, you know, you kind of paint your own picture as things are going versus explaining what's on the picture. Um, you know, but I felt like for my first time, I felt like I did okay. Um, I honestly think calling a regular season game would be much easier based off the fact that uh, you don't have to know 105 names. You might only have to know, you know, maybe 40. And also they don't switch sides in the middle of the game. So that's helpful when you're looking at a roster. You're like, oh, who made that tackle? Definitely not a tight end. Um, but, you know, it was super fun. I had a lot of fun with it. Uh, really thankful to BTN and the crew, Alex, Denny, uh, Larry Putney with me on the call. You know, it was just a total blast. And I hope to do some more of that in the future. And another great thing about game day and being back in Memorial Stadium. Hey, the sponsors of this podcast, you got to have some vows, some victory vows on Saturday. I did, and it was <laughs> phenomenal. I only had one piece because I am a little bit on a diet. But, you know, I got up there, I was in the booth, and I walked through the elevators, and I was like, I know that smell. That is <laughs> that is the smell of Husker game day, Valentino's Pizza. Oh, it was delicious. It was so good. And it just it brought me back to sitting back with Greg and with Ben in the booth, post-game victory vows. And it was just it was good to have that. That flavor. I mean, it, it literally is Husker game day with Valentino's pizza. So it was great to have Valentino's back in the booth. No dessert pizza? No, not this time. No, uh, I got to watch my figure. <laughs> I'm in a competition. I'm another weight loss competition like an idiot. So, you know, I got. I can't I can't just gorge out on pizza. That's for the fall. Okay. Well, how? what were your impressions? What were your big takeaways from the spring game? Yeah, you know, first of all, um, you know, I think that my impression initially is it's good and bad. And, you know, I, I want to start with the good. You know, I think the good was we have some talent that we can build around. Um, you know, I think the bad is the pretty obvious of the fumble issue, the ball security issue. And Coach Rule's not one to say, like, hey, you know, we're going to be okay. Like, he has a standard. 
and you saw him visibly, physically angry with the stuff on the field with the ball security issues. And he got to talk about it, you know, in his press conferences. He talks about it at practice. He talks about it with anyone on the team. Like, there's a reason why we were four and eight, three and eight last year, and it's because of ball security issues. It's because of situational football issues. And I thought that he addressed all those things throughout spring in his press conferences and also to the team. So, you know, as much as that was still a problem, I thought that we saw progress in the right direction, especially on the offense with the running game going a little bit we got to see our first look at the 335 you know there was a lot to digest because this was the first really we saw of the Matt Rule football team with Satterfield's offense and uh, Tony White's defense and so much back and forth that you know I had to go back and re-watch the spring game be like okay what did I miss as I was trying to look at it in real time and you know a lot of the things that I saw on the defensive side were very good um, you know, you saw some young players stepping up, especially with Henrich not playing, especially with Luke Reimers not playing. You know, you saw a group of linebackers that has some depth to it with some um, MJ Sherman and Borders guys. And then you also get to see what it could be when you start thinking, okay, when we add some pieces back, when Ty Robinson gets back, when our linebackers get back, like I can see this defense taking shape. Um, but, you know, I think for the most part, it was – exactly what we thought it was going to be it was going to be rough around the edges but you see the building blocks as we head into spring i um you know I, i've said this a few times and, and for the people that might be panicking a little bit after or just or buying all the stock and saying this player is going to be here on this one spring game performance there's a lot of body of work that happened throughout spring mm. plus there's a lot to come with summer workouts and then fall camp so how much is it also important to remember this was one spring game one practice in all of spring football that you know you don't base everything off of that one outing oh yeah you'd be a fool to think this is what we're going to see in in the fall you know this was such a rough draft such a just an outline of you know kind of what this may be and you can see the bones right that's what you want to see in spring you want to see the bones you want to see the foundation and you want to be able to see okay this is the starting point. Now, when we see them walk out onto the field against Minnesota next week, and then the next time we get to see this team, you obviously want to see a giant jump, and I think there will be. But you just have to understand, you know, spring football, they're not going to run every single play they have in their arsenal. They're not going to show every blitz that they have. They're not going to show everything because, A, it might not be installed yet because we're still learning to crawl before we walk, but also because that's just the nature of spring football. You're not game planning. You're not having specific offensive plays against specific defensive looks. It's just very base, very vanilla of going through and just making sure you can operate the base parts of your offense and defense, which we saw at times. And, you know, I'm excited for where the growth can go. And yet, this is not what we're going to see in the fall. We're going to see a much better football team in September. And they were split up. You know, it wasn't like the entire team. You had some guys that were probably going to be starters. They just split them up so much, and then they were running mm -hmm. back and forth. Some guys weren't playing together. They're going to be playing together. I just, you know, they just wanted to put some guys in some situations and see how they handled it. So by no means is that exactly what you're going to see uh, come come the fall. But listen, what everybody wants to know is what's been your take on the offensive line, not just on Saturday, what you saw on Saturday, but what you've seen throughout your, your few practices that you've been to throughout the spring. You know, I don't believe there was a sack. You There's know, you could call some. You could call some of those fumbles, like okay. those fumbles that turned into sacks. Like those, those are okay. Yeah, those count as sacks. But for me, you know, last year we saw a lot of free runners. We saw a lot of guys getting beat. Like uh, initially, we call those quick beats up front, where you know they're getting back, and the quarterback can't even get through his first progression before he has pressure in his face. And you know, I didn't see a lot of that this spring, and I didn't see a lot of that in the spring game. You know, for me, that's a step in the right direction. Um, you know, I really feel like protection is priority when you're talking about keeping the quarterback clean and how do you turn out on turnovers and interceptions. You don't have anyone at the quarterback's feet. You don't have anyone reaching at his arm when he's throwing the football. You know, those type of things. And, you know, besides a couple times, I thought it was pretty clean for protection. Um, also, you know, you got to see kind of what this offense wants to do with the running the football. You saw a lot of pullers. You saw a lot of split motions. You know, I got to see Nuri pull around and try and kick a guy out, creating lanes. You got to see Fedoni coming in motion. You got to see Billy Kemp coming in motion. Xavier Betts coming in motion. Um, you know, and all those things create confusion for the defense of creating new gaps and those things. But offensive line looked aggressive, looked like they were running off the ball. I think Ben Scott's been a huge addition for us in the middle. I think he's going to be a very good center for us. And you got to remember, we don't have Teddy Prohaska's not out there either, right? So, and then you had guys get dinged, and Nuri was kind of the unsung hero of this game, playing tackles, both tackles, both guards, and just getting thrown in here. So good to have him back in the lineup as well. So overall, very good impressions. This offensive line, I think Donovan Rail has taken a big jump 
with this group being, you know, consistent, being the one coach brought back on staff, you know, I feel like he feels he has a lot of responsibility to make that room great. And I think he does a great job, you know, so I'm really excited for what Rayola has been able to do with that group and the strides that group took in the spring and they've set themselves up for a nice camp in this uh, fall. We're going to have an episode coming up where we are going to go into the weeds talking mm. offensive line talk, uh, our, our next episode. So I'll, I'll save some of my questions for that. But we did specifically have a question on our text line asking about Ben Scott and said that they were pretty impressed with the, what they saw to him on Saturday. So can you maybe dive into him a little bit more and what you saw to him and his performance? Yeah, you know, one thing that I noticed right away is, you know, Ben was one of the few guys still in knee brace, had a little bit of tape on that knee, you know, so I think he was still recovering from an injury that he had had in the spring, but yet he still looked very quick at the point of attack. I thought he did really nice reaching those nose guards, getting up on the second level. He had a really nice block where he went up, got on Jamari Butler. Jamari Butler tried to fall back inside. He turned on him and pancaked him, you know, so I saw a good aggression. The other thing I saw was everyone was lined up. You know, everyone was in the right. I didn't see any MAs of guys going to the wrong place. I didn't see any MAs of guys cutting loose in pass protection. And this is a very chaos, confusing defense where guys are going everywhere. So I think he does a really nice job, not just physically, but mentally. He's going to be great being a man in the middle, being able to say, okay, hey, here's where we're lined up. Here's the mic point. Here's the will. Here's our identification. All those things. You have to have that second quarterback on the field when that's always going to be the center. So I think that he did a really nice job of doing all those things and um, again, with limited reps in the spring because he did get dinged. So I think that he's going to be a good staple for us to be in the middle there. I mean, you lose Hickson, who was a good player for us last year. But I think Ben Scott's a, an upgrade at that position, and I think he could be a potential future uh, NFL player too. Is that your number one pet peeve when offensive line don't get lined up? Drives me insane. I can't. I can't handle it. Like I get. I get irrationally angry. I know you. When do. I see. When I see a lineman cutting a guy loose, or <laughs> one guy slides left, one guy slides right, and the three technique runs up there, and makes a sack, and pounds his chest like he's the greatest thing ever. It's like no one blocked you, stupid. Like don't don't do that. Um, you know. But no. And that's so. Again. Fed my soul, filled my heart a little bit to see um, the center making sure everyone was lined up in the right spots. Oh, that's hilarious. Who flashed to you? Who are some guys that really flashed to you? And not just, again, not just talking Saturday because you've been out to practices. Who have been some guys that have really stood out to you as you've, you've taken in some practices? Yeah, and I know we're hoping to get his waiver clear, but Eric Gilbert, man, that guy, that guy is big and physical and I know he had a couple drops in the spring game but you know what I got to see in practice he had a great touchdown catch he has really good hands I don't know if it was a little bit of nerves or just ball gets tipped or whatever but you know I think that if he can get that waiver cleared you talk about a one-two punch at the tight end position with Thomas Fedoni and Eric Gilbert and then you also have Borkature and you have some other young players um Excuse me. You have some other young players that stepped up. I thought the tight end room flashed. They didn't, they didn't have the big plays. I mean, Borker had that one nice play over the middle. But, but from what they do in the run game to how they can protect in the pass game to also how they're getting out in routes, I thought that that was a position that maybe not on paper and not on the stat sheet really stood out to me or stood out to most. But from what they just do to make this offense go and how Coach Rule and Satterfield want to use their tight ends in this offense, I think that's going to be a really – position of strength going forward for us um, and then on the defensive side you know I think Malcolm Hartzog was great as always I mean as advertised and you know a lot of those DBs have stepped up and you can just see the way that they're playing free they're playing fast they're using their God-given physical abilities to make plays and close down and they're all just gonna have to get a little bit better at tackling that's just the nature of the 3-3-5 you're gonna have five DBs on the field which the offensive lineman in me scares me a little bit but you know if you're gonna have five DBs they got to be trained killers they got to be back there and not afraid to go put their nose up there and tackle a back one-on-one -on -one in space or meet a back in the hole at eight yards and not get juked and out of their shoes and driving through contact and all those things. So I thought all those things were good. I think that you're still seeing those guys learning how to play free, but you saw the building blocks of what that could be for this defense. How about you going to defensive backs? I know. You have five of them on the field. you got to watch them. I mean, if you're going to have five DBs, you can't just ignore them. I mean, there's nothing else to watch, and they're running all over the place. I don't think in two years of doing this podcast, that's been the first thing you've gone to. Is, it hasn't. This is a secondary. But, but they that's going to be They I mean, have some that's... playmakers back there. Yes. It is just, it's, I, when I've gone out to practice, it, that's what's jumped out to me. I mean, Quentin Newsom is a, is a pro. I mean, they've just got some playmakers back there. It's hard not to notice that group. For sure. Yeah, they're flying around. I mean, Miles Farmer looks like he's put on some good weight and he's going to be that quote unquote rover position for them at times. You know, the guy that's 
Think of Jamal Adams from the NFL. Think of Harrison Smith from the NFL. You know, guys that are at the line of scrimmage blitzing, but are also dropping back into a deep third at, on the next snap. You know, you got to have those utility men that can do it all. And they're looking for those type of guys, especially in the DB room, because like I said, three, three, five, five DBs on the field. You got to make sure guys are versatile. You got to make sure guys know what they're doing in every single spot. And you got to have the trust that you're going to trust those guys. Even if they aren't assignment right, they have the length and the ability to go make plays, whether that's falling off a of coverage and making an interception or reading a blitz and seeing that the back's out in protection and they're going to send that extra man and get to the quarterback you know all those things that tony white talks about having this defense play free fast physical it's going to start with the db room it's just the way that this defense is built so the db room really has to step up and lead i guess uh, you know everybody will, will want me to ask you at this point right now how do you assess the quarterback situation jeff sims probably right now i mean he was the, the number one starter yep. casey thompson on the sideline hurt how do you kind of assess where it stands right now Six quarterbacks is a lot. Um, you know, I, I'd be remiss if I said I think all six will be here in the fall. You know, but I thought Jeff Sims came out and had a really good showing. You know, I think he's big, he's physical. Coach Rule talks about how he loves having the mobility aspect of the quarterback to be able to escape and create. And you saw it multiple times of him getting out and creating, but also that big, nice physical touchdown run he had down there in the red zone. You know, those are just things that are really put stress on a defense. You know, and then you go on the other side, Purdy. He has a little bit of that mobility of piece to him. Harburg obviously is probably the most athletic in that quarterback room from a pound for pound perspective, still developing a little bit as a passer. I'd like to see him be a little bit more polished. Um, again, you didn't see Casey Thompson, who started a lot of football for us last year, who I still think is going to be in a tight battle for the starter. I don't think it's fair to just write him off of, of how much he's done for this program, how much he did Texas, and all of that. And how Logan experienced Smothers. he is. You know, that's just. Experience. You cannot. Yeah. You cannot take that for granted. Uh, no, not at played all. played a lot of football. Yeah, in the Big 12 and the Big 10. I mean, he, he understands what he's going to be going in every single week. Um, Logan Smothers, another guy that's played a lot. And then you saw Torres, who had put, played pretty well. You know, he's kind of the, the outlier in that room, the true dropback passer, a little bit more polished, has the bigger arm, you know. So it'll be interesting to see how that room shakes out. Um, you know, it's like I said, it's pretty unrealistic to think we'll have six scholarship quarterbacks in that room as things go. But I think overall it's a really good starting place, and we might have the most experienced quarterback room from a starts perspective in the entire country. I mean, Sims, Casey Thompson, Chubba Purdy, I mean, all those guys have started big-time games in Power 5 conferences. So competition breeds greatness. You know, someone's going to rise. Someone's going to be the guy in that room who has the it factor that Coach Rule talks about. And then it's just going to be about competition throughout the year of who can make everyone better and who's going to lead that football team on the offensive side. Valentino's, a slice of home you just can't get anywhere else. What started with a treasured family recipe in Lincoln, Nebraska, has become a classic Italian tradition for 65 years. Well, got to ask you about Coach Solich being honored, and all. there's a lot of things that go around the spring game. They do a lot of things that you can't get done in the fall, but for Coach Solich to get to come back and the way Husker Nation received him, and, and I talked to him, it just it meant a lot to him, a lot of former players it meant a lot to what was your uh, perspective of that and, and getting to see that done in Memorial Stadium on Saturday? Well, I wish they would have given me a stool in the booth when I stood next to him because it looked ridiculous on camera. Um, this giant in the camera made me look like I was eight feet tall and made Solich look like he was three feet tall. So I wish I got a look, stool. Larry, uh, Greg and I were talking about that too. You just start, oh. you're a big guy. I'm just, you know? I mean, they literally couldn't even fit the BTN banners behind me. You see like this little <laughs> sliver of red above the banners. I was like, all right, next time, you know, learn, adjust, and adapt. Let's get the big guy a stool. Um, but no, it was just great getting to talk with him, seeing the reception that Husker Nation gave to him, and you know Matt Rule talked about it, Trev Alberts talked about it, Dr. Oz, Coach Osborne talked about it. Like it was the fans that finally pushed him over the ability to actually come back, and I think that he really embraced that. You know, you heard Coach Rule talk about it, you heard uh, Trev Alberts talk about it, you heard Dr. Coach Osborne talk about it. Like they were like he didn't want to come, he was very hesitant, and then when Trevor's like, this is for the fans. Like, this is for the fans that love you and want to embrace you and thank you for all of your years of playing, coaching, all of that. That's what pushed him over. I think he really, really enjoyed that experience being out on the field and obviously getting the locker room named after him is going to be incredible. And that's actually the first time I saw the renderings of that locker room. And my goodness, that place is going to be an absolute just perfection of a locker room. It's, it's the best you could ask for. It's the coolest one I've seen, and I've been to some cool places. I've seen Oregon, all those. That's going to be one of the coolest locker rooms in the entire NCAA. 
I thought it was cool too that when you know just again talk about the history and tradition and Matt Roll was just going on and on about how awesome it was to get to spend time with Coach Solich and then I watched a lot of those guys that this was their first time experiencing the tun tunnel walk and and running out in front of you know 66,000 for the spring game and how much it meant to them and how cool of an experience it was because again for for co if you have followed college football you know what the tunnel walk is you know the tradition here and for those guys to get to experience it for the first time I always think that's cool to see their reaction but then for even coach rule to kind of geek out a little bit I thought that that was awesome too yeah I mean in our production meeting with uh, Tony White he was so excited. I mean, he he could. He was over. He's like, we used to play in front of Mountain West teams where there was eleven thousand people in the stands for a game. He's like, there's gonna be sixty six thousand people here for a practice. And I, I literally told him, I was like, Coach, if you opened every practice, there'd be sixty six thousand people at every practice. Like, and that's just what makes this place so great. And those coaches are starting to see it. And I think the the recruits are obviously seeing it. You know, and the players are seeing it. And when you have this much support for a program that goes from spring football to what it's going to be in the fall. Like It's impossible not to fall in love with this place from a coaching perspective, from a player perspective, and obviously from a fan perspective. All right, well, let's talk about um, one of the things that you and I both think probably will they'll hopefully try to address in the portal window that's um, open for, I think, like, what, till Sunday. But uh, I think they're going to maybe try to add some depth in the D-line, which you and I both agree probably needs to happen for this team. Yeah, 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 yeah. We definitely need some depth. You know, you can't – I saw some guys flash. You know, obviously we're going to get Ty Robinson back. You have Nash, Nash Hutchmaker. I thought Nash Hutmaker. Um, you know, you have uh, Buckley, I believe, number 88. I apologize. I'm trying to remember all the names that I called out on Saturday. Um, you know, Win Jr., you saw some guys that are like, okay, there's some promise there for what they can be, but you need to go into season, especially into Big Ten play, with a solid rotation of six to seven defensive linemen. You know, when you're lining up against the Iowas and the Wisconsins and the Minnesotas that you know you're going to get a heavy dose of just inside run for four quarters, it's not, it's not realistic to ask guys to play 60 to 70 snaps and be fresh in the fourth quarter when you need them the most. You know, you want to have guys that can spell for two or three series and not have a drastic drop off in production. So I think we're going to go get a little bit of size in the defensive line room uh, from the portal, if I was guessing. And then also you just need some depth on the offensive line, too. I think we have a solid starting group. I think we have a solid backup tackle rotation. But we really need some interior offensive lineman depth for if guys do get dinged. It's a lot of young, unproven players in there. So getting some players in the portal that have maybe started some games at a power five level or even a lower level um, group of five, uh, the ability to come in and be depth pieces, compete for starting spots, obviously. But, you know, you always have to have depth because NCAA, NFL, high school football doesn't matter. It's a war of attrition. It's a war of who is left standing at the end and who can finish strong. And we just got to make sure we have some more bodies in those rooms that it's not going to be a big drop off from the ones group to the twos group. When I talked to Coach Rule after the game, one of the things he said, uh, you know, as far as what's next for this team, you know, they have to attack the offseason, all of that. But he said, we have to go from being a coach led team to a player led team now. What goes into that? How do you become a player led team? You know, first of all, it requires players to step up as leaders. And I think we've talked about this on the pod before, but being a leader is really hard, especially at the college level. Because when you're a true leader, you're not necessarily always liked by your teammates, you know, because you have to have the hard conversations. You have to have the difficult times of calling someone out who may be your buddy, but he's not up to standard on the field that you expect. But in order to call someone out, in order to be that leader, you have to hold yourself to a higher standard. You can't afford to have a bad day of practice. You can't afford to miss class. You can't afford to show up late to a workout or any of those things. Like you have to be the pinnacle that people look at you and you are the standard. And you're, I think Coach Rule's still looking for who those guys are going to be in each room. You know, he's had a lot of praise for guys like Bryce Benhart, you know, a lot of praise for guys like Miles Farmer. And I think that he's trying to find the leaders of each and every single room. Then he's going to try and find the leaders of the offense and the defense, and then really the leader of the team. And you talk about, like, a guy like Garrett Nelson, who was kind of the undisputed leader of that defense last year, and now he's gone. You know, those are some big shoes to fill. And you have to have where you're policed by your players and your teammates where you, the coach isn't having to worry about our guys doing the right things because if they're not, the players are going to take care of it. 
you know, we had a good amount of that when I played, and I hate being the guy like, back in my day. <laughs> but, you know, when we played and, and when I was a senior, we had four starting senior offensive linemen. We ran the whole team. We ran the entire team. Offense, defense, it didn't matter. Like, we were the standard setters. We made sure everyone was policed, and it worked out pretty well for us. We won nine games, ended up beating Georgia in the in the Gator Bowl for us a senior year. Like, And that was really where I felt like, you know, we had a pulse on everywhere, and other position groups felt like they could come to us, whether it was the D-line, the linebackers, the DBs, the receivers, and we could help mitigate problems. We could help go through solutions and all those things. And so I'm really looking to see what group that's going to be. But that's what Coach Rule wants. You know, it's that's what makes great teams great. I'll, I noticed this. So Luke Reimer, Nick Henrich, neither one were playing, but they were both doing a lot of coaching on the sidelines. They had clipboards. They were coaching guys up. And to me, maybe that was part of it. The, the um, strategy there is, is getting some of those guys to really feel like, hey, take some ownership in, in leading the group, coaching the group up, especially some of those older guys that have been around and played so much football. Yeah, and you know, another thing that Coach Rule is doing is he's making sure he educates his entire team on situational football. And, you know, I, I saw it at practice. I saw it at the games. You know, guys are dialed in at practice of even if it's not my reps, like, what's the situation and what can I learn from this situation? Whether it's a two-minute drill, a four-minute drill, short yardage, red zone, high red, you know, get the first first down type of thing, or where's the clock management. Like, Coach Rule's big on educating his entire team with that, and the only way you can do that is if you're staying locked in all the time. And, yeah, you could have played a lot of football. I mean, Luke's played a lot of football, Nick's played a lot of football, but, you know, on the sideline, you still need to be aware of what's going on throughout the game so that you're not running out on the field like, okay, what's the situation? What, how much time's on the clock? Where's the ball? You know, that's just about being dialed in and learning how to practice the right way, which then teaches you how to learn how to play the game the right way. You know, so that's one thing that I have noticed too. And that comes from also those leaders of just, if you see the fifth year, I mean, I feel like, I feel like Nick Henry's been here for eight years. Like if you see him out there like dialed in to every situation and you're a young player, you're like, okay, I, I want to be like him. I want to make sure that I'm dialed in as much as him. Like He has every excuse to be checked out because he's played so much football. He doesn't need to be as dialed in as he is. But look at that guy. Wow. Like I need to be like that. And that's how you create a culture. That's how you create a culture from the player-led side of it. So, you know, all those things are all good things. They're all in the right direction. I'm really excited about Coach Rule and his staff. And I'm 100% like, these are our guys. Like, no doubt in my mind, Coach Rule and his staff are our guys to lead us to where we want to go. He has a process. It's been proven. He's done it at Temple. He's done it at Baylor. It may be a little bit slower grind than everyone wants, but that's okay, right? It, Rome wasn't built overnight. But I really see the foundation, the building blocks to what Coach Rule and his staff have put together, and it's just going to pay off for us in the long run. All right, NFL Draft Week. You ready? Woo! Thank the good Lord. It is <laughs> finally here. Um, you know, it's been four months in the making. It's been a fast and furious four months, but I'm so excited. We have a good group of guys for the agency this year, and, you know, we have some Huskers that are probably going to hear their names called this weekend, too. So, overall, it's just going to be a fantastic weekend. I couldn't be more excited. Hey, what was your reaction to the Aaron Rodgers news, to the Jets? Of course. I mean, it was just inevitable. You know, I think the Jets overpaid a little bit for a geriatric quarterback, but, you know, I think that they're in a win now mode. You know, they felt like they had a top five defense last year. They feel like they have some really good weapons on offense. You know, they went and got, uh, they have Garrett, uh, Garrett Wilson from Ohio State, who was extremely good last year. You got that young stud, Brees Hall, who's recovering from the ACL. You know, you add Aaron Rodgers, and I already see it like, well, the East belongs to the Jets, you know, and you know Josh Allen and the Bills were like, well, hold on over there. You know, we've done some good things here, but, you know, that division went from a one-horse race with Tom Brady and the Patriots for the better part of two decades to now there's a lot of good teams in that NFC, or the AFC East that is going to be a battle, and Aaron Rodgers immediately makes you a contender no matter where your team was at before he got there. Trey Palmer, the first Husker called? Yes. Yeah, I think Trey Palmer is going to be the first Husker called. You don't run as fast as he did and not hear your name called. That's just nature of what the NFL is. You can't teach speed. Um, and with the production that he had last year, by the way, I know it's Trey Palmer. I called him Lewis Palmer on the air, and people crushed me about it. Sorry, I panicked. <laughs> I know it's Trey Palmer. Um, Trey a lot Palmer, of names yes. going on. There's a lot of names flying around, you know, but I think he's going to be the first Husker called. I think Volkluck has a chance to hear his name called as well. Um, and then, obviously, Oshan is going to be probably that late round as well. Just, again, long, lean, can run. Um, his production wasn't quite where they wanted it to be. Just This is what I'm hearing from NFL scouts. Again, this is not my, like, berating guy. I'm in full scout mode. Um, you know, but you can 
can't teach some of the traits that he had. You go back and look at his TCU film. So I think there's a chance to have at least at least two, possibly three names called for the Huskers this weekend. Where's a good fit for Trey Palmer? Where would you like to see him land? <sighs> That's a good question. You know, I think he fits really well with like a Tampa Bay offense, um, with a with a New Orleans Saints type offense. You know. Guys that like I try to mimic him to the guys like you know he kind of has the speed of Chris Olave, not quite as dynamic in how he can get in and out of his breaks, but he's got that speed and that top end. But really, any team's always looking for the ability to um, take the top off a of defense, and he brings that aspect to it. He's a true burner. You know, you saw Kyrie Thornton from Baylor last year who ran extremely well. People were really mocking him till late in day three, get drafted in the second because of his speed. You know, so I can see him going and fitting with any of those guys that are still a little bit more of the drop back game, not quite as the um, like RPO type stuff, but guys that want to stretch the field, get deep. And so, no, I think he's going to have quite a few suitors for him come Saturday. All right. Well, we'll look forward to talking to you about all things NFL draft coming up. But also, I mentioned this earlier, we are planning on taping an episode. We've had some people ask, I had people ask me after the last. Uh, last episode that we taped, wanting to dive into the offensive line a little bit more, wanting you to really dive into the weeds of that. We we talk a lot of offensive line, but we don't really get into all the weeds. So really wanted to put this out to our listeners, our viewers that are watching on YouTube. If you have questions that you really want to know about the offensive line, anything goes. Let's uh, do a full offensive line episode. I know you're down for that, right? Oh, are you kidding me? I mean, we might need to block off two hours for that episode. I mean, we can get we can get deep in the weeds talking about sword protections, inside foot, lead foot, all kinds of fun stuff, hand placement. So, yeah, we'll dive deep into it, talk more about the intricacies of what makes an offensive line great, what makes an offensive lineman great from the coach all the way down to the players to the depth. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, if you got questions or you got certain games that you're like, hey, what happened in this game or certain plays, you know, make sure you ping those in the comments and I'll make sure I can watch the tape, go back, look at those, and we'll, we'll just dive headfirst into this thing. Yeah, so submit them in, if you're watching on YouTube, in this episode's comments or tweet at either one of us and we will get yep. those lined up. Uh, we're looking forward to doing that and can't wait. We'll line that up soon and, and keep you posted on that. But I think that's about it. Did we miss anything? No. I think I think we're good. We covered all of spring football. We covered the draft. You know, this is kind of you know you take the you take the football season into chunks, right? You have winter conditioning, spring football, summer conditioning, and then the season. So we're two. We're we're halfway home. You know, we're at the halfway point. Kind of a nice break point. Everyone regroups. But now we're really going to start to see what this team's going to look like come into August and September. And I'm really excited. You know, I'm excited to see what this team can put together. All right. Best of luck this week. Can't wait to see Thank where everybody uh, lines up. And we'll we'll talk to you again soon. Appreciate it. Go Big Red. For Jeremiah Searles, I'm Jessica Cootie. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Sideline Slice, presented by Valentino's Pizza.